when there's it's, it's violence on the street, there isn't an agreement. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 338. Today, my guest is Sensei Andrew Moores. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I am dedicating my life to sharing and growing the traditional martial arts through everything that we're doing with this show, with Whistlekick, and with the multitude of other projects that we've got fingers and hands and sometimes even toes wedged into. If you want to see all of those, head on over to whistlekick.com and find out. See everything that we've got going. See all the things that keep me up late at night. If you've been listening for a while, maybe you could leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts or on Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast from. Those positive reviews help people find the show. And let's be honest, if you don't like the show, you're probably not listening. But if you don't like the show, let me know why. I want to know why. Doesn't mean we're going to change it, but I would like to know. And of course, I'm always open to feedback. Positive, negative. Hopefully it's constructive. Just trying to make this better. And the more feedback you give me, the better I can do my job. Let's talk about today's guest. Is it possible to be a diehard, dedicated, passionate, traditional martial artist and still find value, still find importance in the more modernized concepts that some would call more modern martial arts or self-defense-focused arts? I would say yes, and so would today's guest. Sensei Andrew Moores is a passionate, if nothing else, an immensely passionate traditional martial artist. But he also looks at the world through a very broad perspective that goes far beyond what his initial art taught him. We get into that. We get into a lot of other good stuff. So rather than giving you a synopsis here, I'll just step back and let you listen to my conversation with Sensei Andrew Morris. Sensei Morris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Yet another referral from a member of our community, I guess we can say. Somebody that that I know fairly well, somebody that you know and, and... kind of put us together and said, hey, we got to get you on the show. And here you are. You're on the show. Yeah, it was a very passionate uh, introduction to us. I was flattered by it. So uh, um, I appreciate uh, appreciate the uh, introduction and and, uh, getting to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we we start in a pretty obvious way, but I can't think of a better way to really start. So let's let's get this out of the way and let's use it as a springboard to the rest of the things we're going to talk about. How did you become a martial artist? Uh, you know, 1982, I believe, uh, 1982, 83, I was seven years old, six years old, and um, um, just always loved the martial arts and, and uh, um, bugged and bugged my parents. And I was the youngest of three. And they, uh, they carted me down to um, a martial arts school. And, and I remember they're getting started and uh, um, it was in a basement of a, 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 a shady basement of a shady plaza. <laughs> so, um, but I remember before that, and I don't know if, you know, my foggy memory, but I remember seeing a, um, I don't share this story too often, but I'll share it with you is I was in a Papa Gino's with my mom and I saw this man slap a woman. And at a f- age of six or seven, and you, you you don't have a reference point for that. You don't get it. You don't, you know, and, and I grew up in a very affluent area in New Hampshire and, and, uh, um, and just violence. <laughs> the, the worst case scenario is that kid always stole my, my, my uh, chocolate milk money. So I remember seeing it and remember having a feeling of helplessness, just confusion, but, but helplessness. Like I wanted to help, but not really getting knowing what or how to do. And, um, and that, that really stuck with me for, for many, many years. Um, and, and, uh, brought me, you know, even, even that helps, you know, you know, in my competitive career, um, trying to, 
trying to, to solve that helplessness feeling. And I know a lot of martial arts, most artists don't, they, you know, they train, they train, they train, but when it comes to, you know, the, the street, uh, reality, it's like, Hey, I do really great at the dojo, but what if something really happened? Um, and, and so that, that helps helpless feeling really drove a lot of my, my career, uh, since Papa Gino's in the Newington mall 30 or 20 some odd, no, 30 some odd years mm. ago. Yeah. Take us back a bit to that, that moment, you know, you're, you're six years old, so you're young, but clearly you had enough context for life and what went on that it made an impact on you. You're still remembering it today. I'm hearing some emotion in your voice. What do you remember about how you felt? Well, you know, I, there's a part of the little part I skipped over is, is uh, it's that helpless feeling. And then you fast forward. So if I was six years old, fast forward 12, 13 years, um, I trained in the martial arts for several years, stopped, um, you know, ran track uh, at, at the collegiate level. And I was walking home from a party uh, with a uh, uh, with a friend who lived in my apartment building, and her boyfriend or ex boyfriend had come up from Boston. Um, they had broken up, and you know this is years before the cell phone, so there wasn't that phone call or texting argument. He came up to have the conversation, and he had two of his buddies with him. Um, and I remember that helpless feeling that I had back when I was at Papa Gino's as a six year old. And here I am, a collegiate athlete, knowing that if the you know, proverbial spit hits the fan, um, I'll be able to outrun him, but uh, um, I better protect her. And, and uh, so used my mouth and my brains and everything fine, walked her home. And that next morning, um, I called uh, uh, um, you know, a mutual friend who had a school and, and, and I got started uh, less than 48 started back in the martial arts 48 hours later, um, after a six year hiatus and, um, that drive to, uh, squash that helpless feeling and, and, uh, um, it was the hottest fire, uh, um, of my career so far. Mm. Now, if it, it sounds like you're, you're be, maybe being diplomatic or, or, um, you know, maybe there's some, some subtlety in here that you're intentionally leaving as such. And if that's the case, I, I don't, I don't want you to feel pressured to share more than you want to share, yeah. but you're describing a scenario, you know, this, this, this ex-boyfriend and a couple buddies kind of popping up and it sounds like it could have gone sideways, like really badly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the two but buddies. It no, it didn't. I mean, the two okay. buddies behind him, um, you know, here I'm walking uh, a friend of mine. She lived in the, the apartment across the hall from me. Uh, it was a weird night. It was a, a quote, <laughs> riot, unquote, had broken out at, uh, uh, at the university. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and there was you know, SWAT teams there calming the students down. And, um, you know, sorry, not SWAT teams, but riot teams there. All the time, it was just a a hairy, hairy fall night, mm. and uh, the two buddies were behind um, the ex boyfriend. You know, the oh, let's go f him up. Come on, man, let's just let's just drop this guy. Pa pa pa. You know why he's with your girl, and you know, egging them on. And and um, I don't know where it was or where it came from. Inside, I was a little puppy dog, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And, and uh, even uh, um, a fleeting moment of, yeah, you really should have stuck with the whole martial arts thing. <laughs> to um, what came out of my mouth was very different. And, and I had nothing really to lose. Uh, and what I told him that, that nullified the, the situation. Um, what, did, what did you say? I said something along the lines that I, you know, I obviously, you know, your, your voice, um, I was serious, but yet I was friendly and said that, you know, I am going to be walking her home and no matter what happens, uh, nothing is going to happen to her. And I, you know, there's some sharp language that I might've used in there that I don't think is necessarily appropriate for your podcast. So, but was very firm that she 
was going home because she wanted to go home. And um, I basically, over my dead body, was anything going to happen? You know, I, my words um, didn't instigate, but he knew I was serious, but I'd rather that nothing happened. And it worked. He kind of, he just backed off. His buddies were like, what the hell's going on? What are you doing? And but I think he just saw that I was, I was pretty serious. Now inside, I was like, oh my God, someone help. <laughs> there's, there's like 50 police officers on the street right next door. Somebody, anyone? <laughs> but uh, on the outside, I, I knew I had to be uh, um, more of a howler uh, um, and, and make sure they, he knew I was serious. Huh. You know, I've often heard people say that when, when crap starts going down, most people will kind of get chaotic and riled up and everything, but it's the person who doesn't, the person who stays calm in that chaos that you need to watch out for. And it sounds like that was almost your approach. You didn't rise or, or, or lower yourself, however you want to look at it, to what they were putting out there. You just kind of stayed centered i guess if i can say yeah i think that was my didn't know how to react to that so they moved on because again that is a very intimidating thing to see that level of confidence in a heated situation it is and and which you know tony blower who's been a guest in your show um and uh, a a mentor or someone i I trained with for a number of years and um you know he, he he says very eloquently that you know you don't fight fire with fire you fight fire with water and that this occasion happened maybe 10 years before I met Tony or five years. And, and, uh, um, very true. I remember when I heard Tony say that uh, and I go, Oh yeah. I mean, the flash right to that night. Um, I don't think it was natural skill. I'm not telling like, Oh, look, you know, I knew this stuff before. No, I think it was uh, either a dumb luck or just a innate, I, I got to calm the situation down and, and, um, and because I'm, you know, I didn't want anything to go down. Uh, she didn't want anything to go down. And I don't think the boyfriend really wanted anything to go down. The only one that really wanted to go down was the two drunk buddies, you know, pacing back and forth. Um, and I don't know if they really wanted to go down there. I think they were much more of howlers, um, than, 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 uh, I had to be. So, um, but we all got out of it and, um, then that, that, that night, I remember looking up the phone number in a phone book for, for my old martial arts school that had kind of moved on. And, and um, I, uh, I, I couldn't wait to call, but I, I called the next morning because I thought a, a 1 a.m. phone call would be a little sketchy. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, you know, that feeling, and I think a lot of martial arts have the feeling, this was my drawn to, um, you know, to training with Tony Blauer was – you you have great punches and kicks and elbows and blocks and you you got your your solid guard and your passes your mounts and your chokes and da 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 da, da. but yet we still have this little puppy dog inside us that can get a little bit nervous and 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 I'm not sure what to do and that analysis paralysis will 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 enter the equation and so that even after I had won some large full contact tournaments and and then competed at the world the, the international level I still like that 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 itch and a burning desire to, to handle that uncomfortable, uh, um, ness of uh, uncomfortableness of, of not knowing exactly what to do. And, or is this really going down how to deal with the, the mental and the psychological side of real violence? Um, and that led me to Tony and, and, uh, um, by far, I think the best in the world when it comes to, uh, training, uh, men, women, children, professional martial artists, law enforcement, military, um, on how to deal with the mental and psychological side of violence, um, in addition to the, the, the physical skills. Mm. Yeah, I, I would argue that the, the psychological piece, being able to understand that is far more important. Because if you understand that, the physical skills become, in a sense, less important, or, or at least simpler. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, again, not to keep quoting Tony and and I, I promise he's not paid me to, to, to <laughs> quote so many, but you know, the proverbial grandma who defeated the bad guy with her purse. Cause, cause she got pissed with indignation of how dare you. And, and she just smothered him. You know, where did she get her black belt from? 
and and it wasn't it was it was her will to survive her indignation of how dare you and 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 uh, uh, um, just her mental and psychological skills and, and she may have a bad hip and had a cane and she didn't use that cane she smacked him and and the, the real bad guy ran off and um yeah i mean it's like a, it's like a little boy uh, on the edge of a diving board right he knows how to swim he knows how to jump but he's sitting there his legs shaking before his first dive and that analysis paralysis and i'm not shame to admit it and i think a lot of uh, um, martial artists and i think men uh, um uh, are and i think this is silly but you know you 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 train your butt off you train hard but that's dojo stuff. That's your, your gym. That's your, there's a, there's a, a, a agreement between you and your training partner. Uh, um, when there's, it's, it's violence on the street. There isn't an agreement. Uh, you know, I'm not talking two guys squaring off and look like boxers outside a bar. Cause that has a pseudo agreement to it. Uh, I'm talking real life or death violence and, and the psychological side and emotional side are just huge huge i do lectures at, at different corporations i'm i just got an email today about going in next week to a to train uh, um, the entire teaching staff at a local university uh, sorry local community college here um on on violence and 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 my talk is nothing physical it is on the emotional and the psychological side the PowerPoint presentation. I'm not teaching a, a palm heel strike or eye poke or knee to the groin. It is all the psychological and the emotional side to dealing with violence. And then if you rewind a few steps before that, uh, we're talking about how to avoid the violence altogether and, and, and understanding you know, your intuition and, and how that plays into uh, um, your, your awareness and survival skills. Um, and we all spend two hours of PowerPoint presentation in a fancy suit and we do not talk about what's the best elbow strike to throw because at the end of the day, no one says, Hey, what did you throw? What did you do? Or no one grazed you. Hey, you know, uh, Jeremy, you did a nice job with that elbow strike to the bad guy. Um, I'm going to give you a B rating on that elbow strike. Uh, no one does. Everyone's it's, it's more like, did you throw it? And, and, and even a poor elbow strike to the face is going to suck. So, um, you know, did you throw it? And that's not physical. That's the mental and the, and the, uh, the emotional side to, 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 to dealing with something that's very scary. And, uh, but it's enlightening or it's, inf- it's uh, uh, refreshing when you meet seasoned. And you know what it is? It's not as much martial artists. My big paradigm shift with all this came not from martial artists that train, 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 but from law enforcement and military guys. The guys that really see the stuff see the bad stuff um they're honest i remember sitting in a uh, talk with david lieutenant colonel dave grossman um here at sig arms academy and and uh he was talking about the so the, the different things that your body goes through when it uh, uh dealing with violence and you're talking about the you know vasoconstriction and auditory exclusion and, and one of the last things is you know voiding of the uh, of the bowels and I'm like, what? And so on his PowerPoint presentation, I'm like, what are you talking about? Now, I'm in a room full of law enforcement and, and uh, uh, military. And I'm the only, I think there's uh, uh, one of us, um, a buddy of mine, we're the only civilians in this room. Uh, um, and the seminar was Lieutenant, uh, with uh, Colonel Grossman. And, and uh, we're all like looking around, I'm looking around, and I'm seeing all these heads nod up and down. And I'm like, what are you talking about the voiding of the bowels? And, and one of the gentlemen that was right next to me, he goes, well, the LA SWAT team calls it the combat crap. And I'm like, what? And, and it was my time with law enforcement and military that really understood that these guys, you know, martial artists, we play warriors. We play it. We put their gi on. We bow. We play warriors. The law enforcement and military, they are warriors day in, day out. And some of them, yes, might have you know a little nice uh, BS uh, badge they can wear, but most of them, you know, there isn't. They're like, yeah, I remember this in a really bad situation. I was scared out of my mind. And you know what? That's refreshing. Like the fact that these warriors can give themselves permission to to be scared, to be afraid, and then how do they deal with that? 
you know, how do you deal with, with, with that emotion? Do you just bury it and say, well, I was just, I'm, I'm a wimp and I'm just not going to tell my buddies. Or do you start going through fear management training and you doing scenario training that will help you, it will inoculate you to that emotion. And, and uh, um, that was a, a big paradigm shift for me to who I wanted to spend time with. And, and I didn't have time in my life to, to train with, um, you know, folks that are just going to, to, to BS their way through and, and tell me these things that are, that are full of crap. I want one guys that were just, yeah, you know what? Here's what I was thinking. I was scared out of my mind. And, uh, um, and then I got home and I trained it till I wasn't afraid anymore. So that, um, that, that, that was a big part of my, uh, a road I, I've taken and, and, and I visit often. Sure. Well, we've kind of bookended in a sense where you started and a lot of where you are now. I, I know there are other elements to what you're doing now, and I know we're going to get into them. I'm hoping we're going to get into them at least. Sure. But there are a couple big steps there. So we, where we left off, you were ready to get back into martial arts. You made the phone call. So I'm assuming you started training again, and I'm assuming that at some point you, you made the, the decision, I need more around, let's call it reality combatives or, or, or whatever term people want to apply to that. And then you also mentioned that you did some full contact on a pretty high level. So those are, are quite disparate forks in your path. I mean, you know, whether, whether one was a tangent from the other, or maybe there's a loop, you know, how, how do we navigate that highway that, that get, catches us up to now? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think the martial arts world is just a, a beautiful, passionate world that is um, very dysfunctional <laughs> in the sense of, you know, the body moves only a certain number of ways. We can push, we can pull, we can rotate, we, we can change levels. That, that's really it, right? So when, when you're born and the obstetrician doesn't say to your mom, hey, congratulations, we have a Taekwondo specialist here. Or, hey, congratulations, your kid's a judica. Or, congratulations, you are, your, your child's are a reality. We, all, we, we do it. So we have got a karate punch. Sure. Is there a boxer's punch? Sure. Is there little fine differences? There are. So, you know, I have some great friends, uh, some of my best of the best friends that, you know, if I had a, 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 an emergency at four in the morning, they would, they would be up and, and help me out as fast as they could. Um, that they're like, geez, you have such a diverse or you, you, you're jumping a lot of different roads. And I don't think I do. I really feel my strength and conditioning road I take, my martial arts road I take. Um, and I, we do a traditional karate style. But yet I've spent a lot of time with folks like, like a Tony Blauer that everyone's like, well, how do you blend those two? And I don't think there is a big difference uh, from the physical side of things. Because you know, no one comes out. Wow, you're a flower tactical person. You know, you're born. We push, we pull, we change levels, we rotate, and we've got our locomotion. Uh, that's it. And 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 uh, um, so to answer your question, uh, you know, uh, so I trained a few years after in college when I got back into in college, and but something was missing, and it had nothing to do with the reality, or I you know fixed feeling that void of of uh, can I take care of myself in a bad situation. Uh, it was my teacher. Uh, my, the teacher I hooked up with was kind of the, the, the closest guy. It was the same style I had done uh, as a kid. Um, and, but I didn't feel as though it had the, um, it wasn't the teacher I was looking for. Um, and got introduced to um, a gentleman named Stephen Perry, who um, became my teacher because when I met him, immediately I go, this is the person I want to train with. And I had nothing to do with how hard he hit or punched or tough he was or not, or, um, but just was, this is who I want to call sensei. Um, and so I left my other school before my black belt test, um, to start a whole brand different style of karate. And it was the best decision I ever made. Um, I started off as a white belt and uh, worked even harder to, because I was chasing that belt at that time, um, worked even uh, harder to, to, to train in there eight days a week to, to, uh, um, to, to get the most I, I, I could. But it was most importantly that I had the, 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 the teacher 
um, that I wanted, that I, that I felt that I could, could uh, train under. When you made that decision to step into this school with this other gentleman, the one that, that you really wanted to call sensei, mm-hmm. I'm assuming there was some, some fear, some anxiety about making that transition. Uh, you know, there was, and it was a personal fear and nothing to do with belt rank and nothing to do with uh, anything other than I had quit karate when I was 12 years old. And I, tr- you know, took my high school and, and some of my college years off to to, to run in, in, in track and field, um, compete in track and field. Then I, um, and then I started off, then I got back into it and then I quote, unquote quit from that school and and i had this little chip on my shoulder is hey are you quitting you know are you a quitter is this when things are getting tough are you quitter are you a quitter and and so uh, that was my biggest obstacle was to shut that voice up and 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 to prove to myself first and foremost that you know when i was a kid i quit because uh, um, i was about to test for my um, I think it was my brown belt as a kid and it was a big test and I quit and, and you know, talk about the emotional and psychological side of things here. I'm a grown man and, and competed at the highest levels of track and field and, and, uh, um, in, in full contact karate, but I still had, you know, an impression when I was a young boy of, you know, in, in trying to prove that wrong. So, um, you know, that was my biggest thing. Putting that white belt on, I was more proud to put that white belt on than, than my brown belt at my other school. Um, it, it, it meant more to me. It was the, it was the, it was the right path. I was, I was driving down the right road as opposed to wondering, is this really going to take me to the, my, the, the, the vacation spot I want to get to. Nice. Now, a lot of the folks that we have listening have cross trained, trained or, or trained in multiple schools for reasons of choice or reasons of necessity. Yep. But I have no idea what percentage that is. I know we also have a large contingent of folks who have trained faithfully and happily in a single school under a single instructor for many, many years. See, it's funny you say that is, uh, um, it's such a, uh, it's a conundrum. Yeah. We have, in, in the martial arts, we have, you know, uh, um, people that have 21 year experiences. So they train in this style for one year, this guy for one year, this for one year, but they've been training for 20 years, but it's 21 year experiences. On the flip side, we've got guys that do not do anything else, but their one thing for 20 years. And those are two ends of the spectrum. And I think you have to find a healthy middle ground. I'm not saying slab dab in the middle, but it's something that you're not a jack of all trades, but by God, get yourself out of your comfort zone and, and your quote style unquote, and, 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 um, and train, understand if you're not a stand, if you're not a grappler, well, you better bloody understand how to not get taken down to the ground. And if you are a grappler, you better understand what to do on your feet, not just, okay, let's scoot to our butts now. So it's, it's, um, I, you know, I see it in the UFC, uh, with guys that are mixed martial artists. I see it. Everyone sees this. You know, they're mixed martial artists. They're not martial artists. They are, they train in everything. Uh, there are guys that, uh, um, they have a good foundation of a base in one style, whether it be Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Judo or boxing or wrestling or karate. And then they, need to and should out of necessity uh, uh venture off and understand okay i'm a stand-up fighter so now i got my clinching sock so i gotta get you know eat some humble pie and, and start getting in with guys that are catch wrestlers or tie guy or whatever that you know i gotta work my clinch game and uh, my ground games thing so hey, i gotta go join a good bjj school and i get with a good teacher who's going to take care of me and, and 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 really teach me and um but it's that fine line you get a constantly constantly in my biased opinion be sure that you are training all the avenues because as you know no the bad guy doesn't care what style you study you know if that's why you're training for from a self-defense standpoint on the street your style does not matter if you and i are square off one day no one's going to know oh, that guy's a karate guy or oh, that guy's a boxer or oh, that guy's a no it's just it's an ugly bloody 
disgusting, uncomfortable, awful mess and, and, uh, that you got to prepare yourself for. And, and, um, and it's not, uh, style specific. And, and, but with that being said, you got to have some commitment and, 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 and get a good foundation and not just be a squirrel <laughs> or squirrel watcher and, and, and just that, Oh, look at that. I'm going to do that. Oh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. I mean, I see it in strength and conditioning world all the time. It's like um, people are following this great program and they go on YouTube University and they all of a sudden they go, wait, I'm not doing this. I have clients, I have athletes, I have professional athletes that will say, hey, um, how about this? I, I just, uh, where'd you hear about this? Well, I saw it on a UFC highlight film for, for upcoming fight and he was using this equipment. I want to try that. It's really cool. And I'm like, great, cool. Let, let's, let's, let's calm down and let, let's uh, follow this path. And then let's see how we can add that in, but let's not just completely jump off our, our road here. And the strength and conditioning world and the martial arts world, eerily, uh, for all the greats and all the, 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 the bad, uh, follow such a parallel path. Um, that's when people say, wow, you have you know, these two worlds that you, 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 you play with uh, um, on, a, on a high level. Uh, how do you do it? And I go, they really are. They're like brothers. They're you know, like maybe half brothers. Or maybe, you know, brothers just don't really look alike each other necessarily, but they really are. They're, all the egos are there. All the, uh, um, the hypocrisy is there. So that's the bad stuff. But there's the movements. There's the, 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 how the body moves. There's the beauty that you can get from the, the, the both, both sides of the beautiful activities. There's the, the, uh, um, the and that's just the physical. I'm talking the emotional and the, the, the spirited and the well being that you can get from both activities is, is something. So they, they really are uh, cousins, maybe now brothers, half brothers, step brothers, you know, something like that. We've talked about it a lot on the show. I mean, you're, you're checking a lot of boxes and, and listeners, you know, you're probably hearing some, some things coming out of Sensei Moore's mouth that, you know, are, are 95% the words that I've used in the past. Uh, for, for example, there are only so many ways to move the body. And, you know, the, really. the, the way I extend it, and only so many of them make sense through the lens of combat. You know, this weekend I was with, um, I was taking a box and burn seminar with uh, Tony Jeffries, who's an Olympic bronze medalist. Yeah. And, and, and great, great uh, system on how to, you know, teach people that have no idea about martial arts or boxing and how you know great system of pad work because let's be honest a lot of martial artists just suck at pad work and there's no system of how to teach it and train it and hold the pads and i'm not talking hand position i'm like how do you get the best from your student or best from your athlete so you know training with tony jeffries and and i'm sitting there you know and just watching this olympic caliber boxer that I'm like, yeah, but you know, he pushes, he pulls, he rotates, changes levels, and we got locomotion, right? So you know, you can look at every martial art. And you find me anybody. You can go watch a football game, watch a baseball, watch even that they call it a sport, golf, and 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 the human body just moves a certain ways. And and uh, I don't care what color gi you wear, um, or what belt you put on. You're we're all human beings, you know. Um, and we're just going to move in those fashion. Let's, let's shift gears a little bit now. Let's, let's talk about some of the stories. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about your mindset. We've talked a lot about psychology. And, you know, we've, we've kind of hinted a bit about some of the things that have happened in your time as a martial artist and, and some of the things that you've done. And one of my favorite questions, probably my very favorite question to ask, and the listeners know this, is about your favorite story. So when you consider your time as a martial artist, what's your favorite story that came out of that time? What would be the first chapter maybe in your, your autobiography, the one that would hook them in? Oh, um, that's a tough one. Uh, I get, uh, you know, I, one of my passionate things that I, that I do on a daily basis, and I pinch myself every single time I bow in to, to teach classes. Is is uh, you know I'm teaching five year olds up to seventy five year olds, um, 
and and uh, I still pinch myself like, really, is this uh, this is what I want to do when I was seven years old? I want to teach karate my entire like this is phenomenal. Um, and so what I spend a lot of time is making my analogies is 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 um, or to, to get my point across is I'll give a story from 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 my career. So I've got a lot of stories, and now you're putting me on the spot. I I can't think of any that <laughs> would be my absolute favorite. Um, you know, one that I I, I tell quite often, and, and as I was competing in the uh, the all up and down karate championship and, and get my head handed to me, um, at the, in the semifinals. And, uh, the guy, he was such a much better fighter and, and absolutely deserved to win. And, um, watching the finals and, and, uh, um, they're, they're competing. He's competing against a gentleman from, he was Argentina. And, um, and it was, a, it was a white belt lesson on the biggest of the, the, the karate stages and uh they were two to two they were pacing back and forth next person who scores anything remotely close is going to win this you know the, the the biggest coveted title in, in okinawan karate and and uh um, there was a noise that uh, the gentleman that beat me looked over took his his kimai his focus off his opponent and 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 in that nanosecond the gentleman from Argentina threw a beautiful front kick, hit him and sent him all the way back to Spain. We opened the door so he could go flying back out, <laughs> toss him his passport and bags. There you go, pal. It was a great lesson that I laughed at in my mid twenties. But then as I'm teaching it, I'm hearing myself talk to my students from five years old, all the way to you know, 75 years old thinking, you know what? It's all about the basics. And that's a white belt lesson. Focus, you know, whether it be focusing your eyes, your mind, uh, your body. Uh, uh, um, and at the biggest of stage, we can talk about the fanciest stuff. How many, how many different ways to throw a reverse punch or blah, 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 blah. No, it comes down to the basics. Whether you're competing at the full contact karate, boxing, MMA, uh, or really it's just a, it's an ugly situation on the street. It's the basics. It's nothing fancy. So that led me to, I don't care about learning from me personally, uh, um, Kubuto or some weapons, Bo. I, I'm still trying to get my jab reverse punch solid. You know, I'm, 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 I'm 30 some odd years later, I'm still trying to punch harder and faster or better or more efficient. Uh, uh, understand the cue. I'm getting older and, and I'm not as fast as I used to be, but I'm trying to pick up on the, the cues and the pre-contact cues uh, sooner. And then I, I don't have time to play with a Tomfa or Sai or Bo. I, I, I have this burning desire to just get better at a front kick, a roundhouse, a knee, an elbow, and a punch. And, and let me get better at those things and, and uh, I'll be a happy martial artist. Mm. Yeah, when when I teach, you know, as I'm traveling around, a lot of what I'm teaching is borrowed from the things that I've learned from Bill Wallace in my time with him and, and the super yeah. folks. And when he teaches, it's jab, cross, hook, cross, hook, uppercut, round, side, hook kick. Yeah. That's it. Yep. But from those funny... seven techniques, you know, if you consider a three technique combination, I mean, that's seven to the third, what, what's 49 times seven, you know, it's over 300 different combinations. Nobody's mastering 300 combinations. No, no. In, in any amount of time. And he absolutely has, has those techniques mastered. I remember I was in college and uh, he came to do a seminar and um, pulls me out because I'm probably the youngest of the guys. And, and, you know, we could grab the old guy and, and he can look like a stud, but, uh, uh, since he Wallace pulls me out of the crowd and he tells me, I'm going to kick you to the stomach, chest, head, chest, or something like that. And he tells me the order. He tells me exactly what he's going to do. And he goes, block him. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this will be easy. And all of a sudden he plants those three or four kicks and I don't, didn't even touch one of them. And, and, uh, um, that was a, a neat, neat day of, okay, yeah, that, that's, that's the mastering, just the, just the basics getting really good at that. And it kind of goes right back to our guy that does, 
you know, has 21 year experiences. How, how does he really have a good, solid, solid understanding where I'm 30 years later, still trying to get great at my, my jab reverse punch. And you know, when we have intro lessons with our brand new students and I tell them, look guys, you know, I'm still trying to get good at the stuff that, 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 or I'm still trying to improve on the stuff that you and I are working on your day one. And, um, we live in a, a, a squirrel society or what's next, what's next society that, 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 you know, that's what the traditional martial arts to me is, um, that we just focus on the basics, 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 basics. In Japanese, it's kihon. Uh, it just focus on the basics, get really good at them and, and, uh, um, and shine from there as opposed to, okay, guys, today we'll learn something brand new. And the next day, hey, we'll do something brand new. The next day, we'll do something brand new. I don't think that flies very well. It doesn't. And, and actually, I, I, I like your use of that, that word, fly. Because when I'm teaching basics, I will often switch the word up. It's basics, but it's also your fundamentals or your foundation. And so now we have a visual image. And what do we know? We can only build a structure so big based on a fixed foundation. If we can broaden out that foundation, if we can widen it out, we can go taller. The better your, your jab, the easier time you're going to have in throwing whatever's following it. And Absolutely. I think people get trapped in this, this idea that we work on fundamental movements simply for the, the personal development side. The idea that, you know, I've, I've done this punch a million times and I'm becoming a better person because I've done that punch a million times. And yeah, that, that's true. But there's a whole other side of it. And if you look at the best fighters in the world, in any combat discipline, they've all mastered the basics, the foundation. Yeah, you know, you, I think it was Jimmy Pedro, and I don't, um, in the Olympics, he only competed with three or four throws. And, and I, think, I think I want to say it was just three, but maybe I'm wrong. And uh, um, it was a very small number and how many throws uh, um, that or techniques that, that the, uh, that, that are in judo. And that's it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a basics, basics, basics. And, and for the strength and conditioning world, I mean, it's a human trait. We want more complex. We want bigger and, 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 and uh, sh I don't say shinier or it's too simple. It's not simple. It's, it's, do this consistently. And that's where everyone misses. And my biggest holes and things that I feel like, oh, geez, I should have done this better. It comes down to consistency, you know, being uh, consistently lifting or consistently doing this or consistently doing that. You have consistency to your training. There's a thousand one ways to, to, to do what you're trying to do. I mean, this, the, the people, hey, how do I get stronger? And they're trying to make a, uh, this, uh, awful like okay you're gonna do this percentage and then this day and this lift you're doing this percentage blah, 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 blah. you know there really isn't you know you're consistently lift the main lifts whatever it be the three four main lifts get stronger let's grow your general strength let's grow your relative strength um improve that and let's get to your functional and specific strength but you need that good foundation it's just not this squirrel mentality of let's try oh let's go do this let's go do this and the squirrels don't have that consistency i love this quote i heard this quote years ago it was a business uh, uh, meeting and i wrote it down and uh, you know ordinary things done on a consistent basis produce extraordinary results nothing fancy ordinary done on a daily basis over and over and over again will produce that extraordinary results that everyone's looking for. And that is not just martial arts. That's not just strength training. That's business. That's, uh, uh, you know, relationships with your kids, you know, coming in and sitting down and listening when your kid says, Hey, dad, dad, I want to show you this getting down. Your knee. What, what, what do you got? You don't need to go. And, and now the flip side is you ignore your kid. You didn't do what you're supposed to do as a mom or a dad. And you just drop a ton of money on them and to make, you know, make up for the, the, the crap you should have done or crap you didn't do, or crap you did, however you want to look at it. And um, it's, it's that consistency, you know. Another field, there's a, there's a period in my life that I did uh, threat assessment and, and, and protection work. And it was the exact same thing. 
it was the basics. We didn't have to get very fancy when we're dealing with uh, whether it be a domestic violence situation or a stalking situation or a workplace violence situation where we're looking at, and from an assessment standpoint, what's the likelihood that this could uh, result in a, um, something violent happening to the, uh, uh, to the client. Um, it wasn't fancy. It was super simple. So, you know, I, we have strength and conditioning, martial arts, and risk and threat, threat, threat assessment. I mean, it all is the exact same stuff. Let's pull a, a, a top chef in here, a mechanic and a carpenter. And I'm sure they're going to say the exact same thing. And, and you know, it's something I'm very passionate about uh, because my nature my, um, is I am that squirrel, you know, um, from my tension issues as a kid or my anxiety issues as a kid, I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And, and uh, another great quote is that, you know, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. Uh, Dan John, who's a, uh, a well-known strength coach, uh, I remember him saying that years ago. The goal is to keep the goal the goal, and and I have to remind myself that on a daily basis. Even though I'm on my little soapbox here preaching the crap, <laughs> that you have to just get. What's your goal? What's my goal to get done today? What's my goal? I want to get stronger. What's my goal? Uh, I need to uh, teach better. What's my goal? And just keep it your goal. Just just keep that your consistent goal. And sky's the limit. It would be martial arts. Uh, uh, fitness, strength and conditioning, uh, competing, um, you name it. It is uh, just those basics done consistently over and over and over again. And yes, it's boring. Yes, there's uh, um, uh, a discipline that will form from it, but my golly, is that uncomfortable because you just want to move on to a different movement but or a different technique or a different philosophy or a different idea and scratch that itch. But the best thing is don't scratch that itch and, 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 and stay at the path. Mm. You know, I, I will challenge that statement a little bit that it's boring because it doesn't have to be. You can train the, that same jab. Oh, absolutely. In an infinite number of ways. No, I, I agree. And, and uh, I'm... And I, uh, we get, we get bogged that. down in that, right? You know, a, a lot of times martial arts is taught by people who are not terribly imaginative. And they have, the, the only things in their toolbox are the things that they're, unfortunately, in, in most of the cases from what I've seen, the single instructor that they had, had. And so they're, they're kind of, they're not innovating martial arts, they're passing martial arts on. And so if they only know three ways to, to train that jab or back fist or whatever you want to call it, straight punch. Yeah, it's going to get boring. They're, they're just regurgitating yeah. what they heard. And, and uh, so as a teacher, the beautiful, I mean, this is what I sink my teeth into and, and the, what keeps me up at night um, is coming up with new ways to make their front kick better, their reverse punch better, whatever it may be better. From a tech, from, I'm talking from the technical standpoint. So, you know, I, I came from a world where you did your 10,000 front kicks and you'll become good at it. And I said, well, how do I get a better front? Well, keep doing front kicks. And you sit there and just slam your head against the wall. And I met some wonderful teachers. My, my original teacher, Stephen Perry, um, one of my teachers now, Sensei Ron Fagan, uh, who really, let's, okay, let's break the front kick down. Let's break the roundhouse kick down. What are we doing? Okay, let's break this kick down to four different movements. It might be the knee driving, might be the hip rocking action, might be the extension of the foot, might be whatever. And now let's come up with drills to make the knee drive of the roundhouse, the knee drive of the front kick, the knee drive of the side kick, um, or the hip rocking, or the hip is the hip rocking on a snap, or are we locking out on a thrust? How do we make the individual components of that one kick better? And now let's come up with drills to build the skills to do that. And and that stuff gets me. I'm sitting here almost drooling on my computer talking about it because that that that's fun. You know, how do you get someone? Anyone can build. A, you know, I uh, love you. You see people like, oh, look at my great students. And like the kid would, he's a phenomenal athlete. He would be great at anything he did. You know, find me the teacher who has uncoordinated students and made them into great martial artists. And that's the guy that I want to sit down with and say, hey, what did you do? You know, how, how do you get that 72 year old who's got a uh, um, more fake parts 
uh, in his body than, than, than half of Hollywood. How do you get them to have, develop a good front kick? What did you do? Your single leg strength work you did? To, so when he brings up his leg, cool. All right. And, and how, do you, how do you deal with this, 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 and this? And what are the drills? I mean, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night. And so going right back to your point, yeah, it doesn't get boring. I mean, 30 some odd years later, I'm still trying to make a jab and a reverse punch and a front kick and a side kick, maybe a side kick, uh, uh, um, a roundhouse kick better. Um, and how do I, more importantly, my biggest passion is how do I make my students better, better than me, have them stand on my shoulders. Um, so they, I become insignificant and they just find me a small village and move me there. So that, that's, that's fun. That's exciting. That, 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 I can't imagine the martial arts ever getting boring with that being your, your drive. Hmm. Fully agree. I mean, we have... Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was saying, you know, when it comes from a front kick standpoint, our, our five to seven-year-olds, we have 10 major front kick drills that these kids do, and they're not even throwing a front kick. They are training the different components of the front kick. Uh, the next group, our next older group, because we divide our curriculum up, just, you know, obviously by age and ability, but you know, it's there's a little science behind it when it comes to the bio uh, biomotor skills sets that the kids have, the students have. Um, so now we take, we've got another five to eight drills that we consistently use just for the front kick. We'll add on to those ten, and they're still not necessarily doing a full fledged front kick. And then we get to our teen and adults, which is a totally different uh, motor skill set. And they are now drilling uh, um, X, Y, Z. We're working on the ball of the foot. We're making sure the knee is driving correctly. Um, and and uh, uh, the foot position, the knee position, the hip position. And it's fun and exciting. They've got a great sweat going on. It's not like we're just sitting there pontificating on how to do a front kick. It is They are drilling from an athletic standpoint how to make their kick better, as opposed to the school of, well, just throw your 10,000 front kicks. And that, 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 yeah, you have to throw 10,000 front kicks. But imagine if you can get better at, at you get pretty darn great at 1,000 front kicks because you trained by design and not by accident. And then once you get to that 1,000, put your 9,000 more in because now obviously you'll be even better. But it's by design. And, and I think just, uh, um, you know, I'm frustrated with the number of years that I trained that it wasn't by design. It was just, well, just do the front kick. It would just kick harder. Well, how do I get a harder kick since I just kick harder? And I'm like, well, that, yeah, I'm trying to become a harder kicker. And, and take martial arts, now compare it to baseball. If I ask my coach, just, hey, how do I get a better swing in baseball? Or uh, my bobsled coach, how do I get a better start? How do I get into the sled better? And they said, well, just get into the sled better. <laughs> You're like, what? What are you talking about? Why do you think uh, that happens? Why is martial arts so archaic? Okay, yeah, <laughs> we'll use yeah. that word. Uh, I think uh, tradition. I think uh, loyalty to our teacher. Um, I think you know. I look. I, I'll go to a strength and conditioning conference or train with folks, or I'll be with um, a collegiate sports team, and I'll see how these guys move and explode. And then I'll go to a martial arts uh, thing the next weekend and people are like, oh, lifting weights is ridiculous. It's going to slow you down. And you're sitting there, really? Let's go, let's go over to the Patriots uh, weight room and tell those guys they're slow and they're not explosive. And they have no idea how to, do, uh, how to you know, develop speed because we're just humans. We, we move all the same. When you become a martial artist, you don't all of a sudden mutant into a different uh, uh, um, species. <laughs> we're mm. still human. Right. And, and Martial arts just have this idea of, and they, don't get me wrong, I love the martial arts. I, I love traditional martial arts. Uh, I am a weichi, uh, a weichi cub, and, and you don't get much more from the from a karate standpoint of traditional martial art. I've never put a blackie on in my life. Now that, that determines non traditional versus non traditional, but to give you an idea, uh, it, you know, I love that I train a traditional martial art. But my glasses that I choose to look at things for my students first, for me, and for my for my martial art of Weichiru, uh, is how do we make it better? How do we move the body better? Not because of my, you know, I, one of the biggest things, a blessing is my my teacher, Sensei Perry, and one of my current teachers, Sensei Ron Fagan. 
it wasn't about us. It's not about them. It is about how do we make the next generation better stand on our shoulders? Because that's how it has to happen. In 100 years, martial arts better be, uh, should be better by design, not because of better athletes, not because of technology. They should be better because of the blood, sweat, and tears that the teachers put in, sitting down there with their notebook and trying to come up with better ideas of how to make the students improve on X, Y, Z. Stand on our shoulders. Make them better. I would, I, I'm excited for the day that my student, and I've had it, when my student does something better than me. I don't, my ego, sure, it takes a ding, but a big smile comes on my face because it's like, good, good. Stand on my shoulders. Be better than me. And, and um, uh, you know, why martial artists? Maybe it's ego. Maybe it's the romantic side of, you know, the sensei and the student or the senpai and the kohai, the senior, the junior. And now you always want to keep your, you put your sensei on a pedestal and, and, um, and, and you should from a, a respect and a sacrifice standpoint, but uh, understanding my responsibility, and this is probably the, you know, if you can sum up my teaching, uh, Jeremy, is my responsibility isn't to my teachers, my responsibility, or nor is it to my style. My responsibility is to my students. And, my, and then it gets even heavier from there. My responsibility is to my students, students, and then my students, students, students. Um, and, and that keeps me up at night and, and makes me think about my, uh, my legacy and am I I'm following the right path uh, as far as my concern for making students better, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so. Let's face it. If you're not making your students better than you, then martial arts is getting worse. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, you, you, that's, it doesn't grab a scrap piece of paper and you put the today's martial arts at a level 10 and then you, well, my student's not as good as me and then become level eight or they not, and then boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden we've, we've, we've rescinded and, and, um, but you know, the, the broken clock is right twice a day yep. and, um, a really bad teacher can produce great students because, but wasn't by design. You know, it's, it's because that student it was a, it was, oh, the student was a phenomenal athlete. They would be a great chess player. They'd be great at, uh, uh, croquet. Right. Um, but are they, you know, said, you know, that's why I, I, I have some, some, uh, older students. I mean, I got a, uh, professional fighters fun to train with. Don't get me wrong, but my gosh, what pushes my buttons is a, a, a student who's got uh, a fake left. Let's see. I'm trying not to, to, you know, divulge too much privacy here, but <laughs> sure. you know, uh, yeah, you know, hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement, blah, blah, blah. And, but yeah, they get up and they say, sensei, you know, I, I want to train. And you're like, okay, well, we got some of the two left feet and you got to make them into a, 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 you know, a decent martial artist and, and, and uh, um, you know, that stuff, that's, that's just, you can sink your teeth into and, and, um, but I think there's a lot of folks out there, unfortunately, that, that don't see it that way. They just say, you know, what, what can my student do for me as opposed to what can I do for my student? So well put. So tell, tell the audience now, you know, what do you, what do you have going on and how might they reach you? You know, you, you've, you've said some pretty poignant stuff today, some stuff that I'm pretty sure is going to connect with a lot of the folks that we have listening. And they may want to follow you on social media if that's a thing for you or find your website or email you or whatever communication methods you want to put out. So, you know, let's, let's step into commercial time now and you can kind of stand on a soapbox and yeah. tell people all that stuff. I, I don't have a great black belt in social media. Um, I'm, I'm probably a mid range green belt, green belt, but, um, AtlanticRide.com is our school's website. You know, one thing we're, we're launching hopefully in 12 months from now, uh, I'll say, hopefully I'm taking that out. You and I were talking prior to this right. in 12 months happen. from it's happening. I'm, I'm telling everybody and, and to hold myself accountable, like Muhammad Ali held himself accountable for his, his training. Um, you know, Marshall athlete, uh, is going to be a, a huge project for, I say us, uh, my staff here, myself, um, of developing the martial artist as an athlete. And I'm not taking the combatives or the self-defense side out of it. And, but look at it from an athletic standpoint. So, you know, um, you know, my what, what 
fuels my fire is all right, 10,000 front kicks, or how can we get that support leg to be stronger? That left leg, when he brings his right to throw a right front kick or a roundhouse kick, how do we get that stronger? How do we work on his mobility and from his knee, hip, and feet, or her knee, hip, and feet? How do we make that? So at, 10, at 1,000 reps, they are 10 times better than I was at that stage. And how can we look from a strength and conditioning standpoint to make our students better? You know, front kick is my favorite analogy, and I've used it quite a bit in this, this podcast. But, uh, you know, you bring your, your leg up and you throw a front kick. Now, you need to have that support leg, that left leg or whatever leg is still on the ground. That determines how great your kick's going to be. It's not the kicking leg. It's the support leg. So if it's the support leg, like a great foundation to a martial artist, that support leg's your foundation to the ground. Shouldn't we understand how to make that better and stronger and more mobile and, and, and get what we need? And whether it be a 30 degree uh, bend of the knee and uh, whether it be, you know, oh, I, might, I, I, can, I can back squat 450. Great. That's two feet, pal. <laughs> I only see you on one foot. With a um, with that slight bend, now rock your hips forward, and do you have the the hamstring mobility? Do you have the hit? You know, there's there's a ten point system we will run through with our students to just to make the the kick better. So that's a martial athlete um, uh, that that we're going to shoot for for August first of two thousand nineteen. Which I'm making this very public, aren't I? Mm, so you are. Um, we're, yeah, we're. It's, it, I'm excited. It, it combines my martial arts with my strength and conditioning, two passions of mine. If you look at my, one of my two large bookshelves here in, in my office, um, half, you know, I've got my security uh, work threat assessment, but then I've got my uh, strength, conditioning, and, and um, um, my martial arts uh, side. So it's, uh, it's a passion and, and uh, something that um, talking to fellow martial artists that uh, they're, they're hounding me about to uh, to get off the ground so i'm i'm trying to clear away my life here to, to make that work nice and longtime listeners know that you know strength conditioning are are pat it's, it's a passion of mine as well you know we've had some folks on out of the crossfit community which is you know another world that i spend a lot of time playing in and and you know you said it early on it, it's all it's all movement it all relates and just because we're martial artists we're not some weird species but of course, you know, it, yeah, it's funny you say CrossFit because I remember I was doing a, I was training a fighter for a fight. I don't remember what we were doing. I really couldn't even tell you what we're doing. And someone comes in like, oh, you, you're doing CrossFit with them. I'm like, well, what do you mean I'm doing CrossFit with them? I, I really was curious and it wasn't like, you know, being argumentative. I'm like, I really wanted to understand. Like, well, I, I saw a CrossFit person do that movement. And I'm like, and it was like the most arbitrary. I, I couldn't even tell you what it was. Was it a reaching lunge? Was it a, I have no idea. I, I didn't even know, you know, and, 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 uh, but that's the human eye. I, I believe in human nature, they, they want to categorize something. And, you know, because the person's doing a sprawl, which might look like a burpee. And, and, and if you want to, and obviously CrossFit doesn't own burpees, but yet the people would just say, Hey, that's a, that, that must be this. And it's the same thing as, oh, oh, you must do boxing. Like, no, I don't box. Well, that punch looked like a, like, it's a punch. It's a punch off the, the rear side using, you know, my hips are moving on the transverse plane. I'm extending my, <laughs> what are you talking about? It's just, it's human nature. Um, and, and to, to kind of group folks in there. And I go back to, we push, we pull, we change levels, we rotate, and we have locomotion. That's it. There's no other way to, 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 uh, you know, um, the body to move, whether it be CrossFit, uh, whether it be quote, functional training, unquote, whether it be, uh, martial arts, whether it be track and field, whether it be wrestling, that that's what we do. And, and, um, but I guess, you know, psychology, let's bring a sports psychologist or a organizational psychologist onto the show and explain why as humans. We have to organize things into these little cute little boxes. Mm -hmm. I have some theories, but I, I'm pretty sure that would kick us off into another hour of discussion, which I'm sure. we didn't schedule for. So I'm not gonna no. I'm not gonna <laughs> pin you that. But hey, you know we can we certainly chat about that again. And of course, folks, you know the the things that we talked about today, we'll link them over on the website whistlekickmarshwartsradio.com. If you're new to the show, you can grab the links there. 
and I know uh, during I am we are on. I mean, I joked about the social media because my my buddies tell me I need to do a lot more, and uh, <laughs> we are we're, we're kicking it off. Uh, um, hopefully, uh, um, technology wise, uh, um, uh, in two weeks we'll be producing producing a lot of content uh, drills. Uh, we're going to call it a martial art minute, which is just going to be a nice 60 second of a drill focusing on one very uh, focused thing. Awesome. Uh, one aspect and be nice videos. We're on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, we're all there. It's just, uh, um, you know, it's a little bit, I, I'm a human. I, I like this. I like talking to people sure. and this, and I get a little leery about the whole, so, you know, just putting it out there. It's a shiny little package for people to see and it's your highlight reel. Right. Dave Ramsey said that best social media is your highlight reel. Mm. And, 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 uh, um, you know, here I'm talking, to my, no, and, and I'm talking to my students about being authentic to themselves, authentic to their training. And then um, I'm kind of flirting with this social, uh, unrealistic world. You know, um, I remember seeing a picture and we're, we're getting off topic and you can tell me to shut up, but uh, there was a, I saw these photos from a friend of mine and it's like this gala. Right. And, and uh, I'm like, wow, now they, they're beautiful people. They're successful people. Right. And, and so I click on like their, their, their profile, look at their name, like, wow, this looks beautiful. So then I, I happened just to Google them and they were, uh, I think they're still, they were on probation for taking money for some kid they'd adopted and they took this, their parents had died. I mean, it was this awful thing. It was awful. Like, and, and talk about what the shiny looked on social media and how it looked uh, just nice. And like, wow, I want to be those people. And, but then you peel the onion back, proverbial Shrek, proverbial Shrek story. You know, you, there's lots of layers here to someone you peel the onion back and, and you're like, okay, you know, that, that's the, that's the real truth. And, there's my hesitation. The social media world is just, do I really want to quote flirt with it? And, and to what extent? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an amazing, an amazing world out there. And, and I think if people applied the principles that we learn in martial arts to the way they consume social media, yep. we could see oh, some dramatically different things. Yeah, you uh, absolutely. I, I can't. I can't agree. <laughs> can't agree with you more. I'm sitting here smirking and biting yeah. my tongue. Well, thank you. Let's let's tie this up. Let's give the folks the some words to go out on. You know, we would like to call it words of wisdom, or you know, you can apply any synonym in there you want for it. But just something poignant that we can we can drop here at the end of our time together for the folks listening. Huh, you put me on the spot here. I, I got uh, That's what uh, I do. It's my job. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You, you're doing a great job at it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of things probably, you know, I, you know, what we just ended with, like, you know, take what you just did on the training floor and apply it to every part of your life and, and, and be genuine to that. You know, the, the bow, the ray in Japanese, of, you know, ray literally means respect. It does not mean bow. And you're constantly reminding yourself of, of, uh, you should be of of respect when you're bowing and you hear your sensei saying it. Even the word sensei. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier off the air of sensei is not a title. Sensei is a role. And and anyone that treats it, and unfortunately, and a lot of folks do, and, and wonderfully, a lot of folks don't, they treat it as a title. Call me sensei. And they put their thumbs in their belt and they ha ha ha. <laughs> and and, and it's, a, it's a role. So when I hear someone says sensei, or I hear my daughter say daddy, I say to myself, oh crap, that's right, I'm a dad. Or that's right, I'm a sensei. I have a responsibility. When you look at it from that focal point, and you might be listening to this, well, I'm not a sensei. Well, we don't have names like that. Well, you're a martial artist, you're a student. So I hear a student of mine, whether it be five-year-old or 75-year-old, say sensei, and I don't sit there and beat my chest. I sit there and say, that's right. I have a responsibility. Like when Dr. Johnson hears his name, Dr. Johnson, or has a role pulled out, it's not a title. And, and, and if you look at it from that little paradigm shift, the crap rolls uphill. You've got a responsibility to do whatever it is you're 
role slash, you know, if you want to call it a title is, you know, don't look, don't, don't sit there. I'm a Hanshi. I'm a she, you know, you go to the Jap- you go to Japan, Okinawa and they, they say, you know, Shihan. And, and they're like, what are you talking about? No one, you know, no one calls, they don't call each other Shihan. It's not, a, it's like they will sit there and laugh at you. But in other parts of the world, America, uh, will, or, or, you know, in Europe, they'll, they'll tend to do it. And, uh, I've never introduced myself as sensei. I mean, you, when I, when you call, you ask me what I, like, what do I, I got a little uncomfortable, didn't I? Yeah. I, I it just doesn't, but it, it cause it's, it, it's a role. Um, and, and I, I think if we, as, as teachers treat it as such, I think the martial arts world might change. I really think that that's a, that's a huge piece. So whether you call yourself guru or professor or sensei, you know, or, or, or whatever is remind yourself. It's a reminder. And you know, you, Hey, I'm a karate student. I'm a karateka. I'm a, I'm a BJJ, uh, a stylist. I'm a, I'm a judica. Remind yourself. You're, you're a judo student. You're a judo player. You're, you're, you're a student. And what does that mean from, your discipline, from your morals, from your respect, from your training, uh, um, and use that filter, the, that litmus, uh, say, you know, use that filter for everything you tackle throughout that day. Everything from a podcast to putting your shoes away perfectly straight on the shoe rack at the dojo, but also at home uh, um, to you know, you, you treat your partner with great respect, but then you go home and you treat your wife with crap. I mean, it just make it, 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 you're a hypocrite if you don't. I think if you had told me how similar Sente Moores and I would be in our philosophies, I wouldn't have believed you. But here I felt I was talking to someone who really kind of checked all the same boxes, had a lot of the same experiences, a lot of the same realizations. And it's always helpful to talk to people who feel similarly to you, but are able to articulate it well. Because I'm constantly looking at my own set of beliefs and seeing, should they be refined? Should they be revised? And if you got half of what I got out of today's episode, you're probably smiling. So thank you, Sensei Morris, for coming on the show. You can head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to find out more links, photos, all kinds of other good stuff. Do it. If you haven't been there in a while, check it out. We're constantly making improvements. We've got some new navigation up there to help you hone in on episodes by region or by style, if that's important to you. Maybe you'll find an episode you forgot about or didn't even know that was there. If you want to email me, you can do so, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and you can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. If you're not following us on Instagram and you use Instagram, you are missing out. The stuff that we're putting out, I I don't even put it out personally. So I get to follow along just like everybody else. It's awesome. I love it. One of my favorite accounts. And of course, you should probably head on over to whistlekick.com at some point, see everything that we've got going on there. If you don't check in with that site monthly, you're probably missing out on the new stuff. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile. And have a great day.